good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Cedric Slufnjanouac. I'm a PhD student at the University of uh, Antananarivo here in uh, Madagascar. My project is funded by Q Madagascar Conservation Center or KMCC, a branch of uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens Q in Madagascar, where I am currently based. Uh, I'm co-supervised by Maria Voronsova, Caroline Lehman, who is based at the Royal Botanic Garden of uh, Edinburgh, and uh, Prof. Lulniena Janota at the University of uh, Antananarivo. And uh, today I am going to talk about the uh, results of my project and our recent discovery on grasslands, not wastelands, but the creation of ancient creatures. Mm -hmm. I will start with uh, talking a little bit about the uh, KMCC. Q Madagascar Conservation Center is uh, composed of a team of predominantly Malagasy botanists. Our main office is based uh, here in Antananarivo since uh, 1999, and uh, we have uh, four other field uh, offices. Our uh, local team manager is Dr. Uh, Helen Jalmanen. And uh, the teams are working on research and conservation projects, such as uh, protected area management and uh, species conservation with uh, the Millennium Seed Bank project. Currently, KMCC counts uh, 19 botanists who do more than 10 field trips per year. And it also provides training, including 12 MSCs and uh, 10 PhDs and I am among those uh, PhDs. So this is a picture taken in uh, January this uh, year during the launch of a massive tree planting in Ankazu Bay, a region within Madagascar's central highlands. The big project aimed to plant 60 million trees to mark Madagascar's 60 years of independence this year and in the hope of uh, restoring the island's lost forests. In fact, uh, there's a narrative of the island being once entirely covered with forest, and grasslands are considered as only a product of human degradation in need of restoration. And this perception has put off researchers examining their ecology, evolution, and dynamics. And this is why Malagasy grasslands are fundamentally misunderstood. However, they support the livelihoods of people. They provide essential food, cultural and financial resources to, ma to many millions of Malagasy. Besides, it's also surprising that within these presumed homogeneous and degraded ecosystems, Recent taxonomic and biodiversity studies by Maria Voronsova have documented a diverse and ancient grass flora. For example, here, uh, Isal is home to 112 grasses. And uh, in this particular patch of savanna shown on the picture, there are seven perennial pyrophytic grasses within only 50 meters square. None of the 10 endemic grasses found in Isal savannas are represented here, but all the species are also common in Africa savannas, and uh, there is evidence that all are native to Madagascar. Another example is uh, Wapaka Bojeri, locally named the Tapia woodland, a distinctive endemic formation of the Central Highlands. Tapia are uh, fire tolerant trees and grow in association with other woody species, many belonging to families endemic to Madagascar. And on this picture is a patch of uh, tapia woodland in Ibit Massif. And the three endemic grass species are found here Panicum ferrieri, Panicum ibitiense, and Stapiocloa ichcochiae. And all of them are restricted to Malagasy Central Highlands. Here we have the distribution of available grass species occurrence data for Madagascar based on herbarium records and the field locations. We can see that 
endemic grasses are found across the island and all significant components of the grass flora. Madagascar grass endemicity is around uh, 40%, which is low compared to dicots, but normal to high for grass of uh, subtropical islands. But grass diversity sampling to date is uh, heavily biased to the main road network and the central highlands. The eastern, western and the southern regions are vastly under collected and uh, it will be equally important to extend our sampling to these regions. And for my project, I aimed to implement that the taxonomic knowledge of grasses developed by Maria in an effort to fill the stark knowledge gaps around the ecology of these diverse ecosystems. And for that, I sampled different grassland sites across the central highlands to better understand their functional ecology and uh, biogeography. In one part of my thesis, we aimed to differentiate vegetation types that co-occur as a mosaic uh, across the central highlands. These are open grassland, tapia woodland and uh, forest. Within the region, tapia woodland have been historically and persistently classified as uh, degraded forests. But by looking at the different types of grasses and their functional characteristics, we found that grasslands and tapia woodland are highly similar in cross species composition. And these grasses are characterized by the same functional characteristics, such as being tall, growing vertically and with coriaceous leaves. And these are all traits that make those grasses adapted to the open environment and the frequent, frequent burning in these systems. In contrast, forest grass species composition significantly differed from both grassland and the woodland, and they are growing laterally with herbaceous leaves. And these are also characteristics that allow them to adapt to the low in light environment in uh, forests. From these results, we concluded that tapia woodland is a form of uh, savanna and not forest as have been previously suggested, so we should manage them as such. And these are examples of grasslands landscapes that we can find across the tropics, here in Madagascar, in South Africa, in India and in Malawi. And, uh, one of the arguments for grasslands as a human derived is the pattern observed of forest fragments in the central highlands. Well, as we can see, patchworks of abrupt ecosystem boundaries occur globally across the tropics. And the phenomenon observed in Madagascar is more the rule than the exception. Next, I will show you results of our recently published work on uh, distinct grass species assemblages in Madagascar. Like in Africa, fire and uh, grazing are the main disturbances maintaining the dynamic of grasslands in Madagascar. And by analyzing the grass species composition of these systems, we found that uh, they are characterized by distinct species assemblages with a minimum species overlap, as shown here on the matrix of correlation between pairs of species obtained from a generalized linear model here on the right. The top triangle of the matrix is composed of uh, cross species highly likely to co-occur with each other and sampled in grazing maintained grasslands. The bottom triangle is composed of species highly unlikely to be found with species in the top triangle and or from fire-maintained grasslands. Then we looked at the different traits associated to each species and clustered them based on their uh, characteristics. And what we found was that grass species in grazing-maintained grasslands have similar traits, here grouped on the left of the dendrogram, but different to grasses in fire-maintained grasslands, 
the group on the right. Crazy maintained grasses are characterized by predominantly short, mat forming, high bulk density with large leaves. And these are traits that make the grasses palatable and attract grazers. The same traits typify grazing lawns all across Africa. In contrast, fire maintained grasses were primarily tall, cespitose grasses with narrow leaves and low bulk density. And these are traits that make these grasses flammable. Additionally, these identified assemblages contain many endemics, 30 to 40 percent, which predate human arrival by millions of years, with a divergence age ranging from 1 to 7 million years, as we can see here. The endemic grazing adapted observed in our study are dependent on grazing to proliferate, and such grasses would have rapidly become extinct without the presence of a grazer to keep their habitat open. And their origins are estimated to coincide with the evolution of past grazers, such as hippos and grazing tortoises. So, we suggest that in the early Pliocene, those grazers were instrumental in the evolution and assembly of the obligate grazing lone flora we described. Cattle, hippos, and grazing tortoises share key functional similarities. They all prefer highly palatable grasses with high bulk density to maximize their intake of uh, nutritious food per bite. And on the African continent, hippos are short grass grazing specialists that play an important role in initiating grazing loans in high rainfall areas uh, with, uh, with their broad mouths, hippos crop grass tufts and can convert high biomass tall grass system into short loans with a unique floristic composition. So our results demonstrate that fire and grazing are playing fundamental role in both the evolution of Malagasy grasslands and their modern dynamics. We showed that the niche of grasslands in Madagascar are not so different to grasslands elsewhere, and that these systems should be recognized as natural part of the region with ancient origins. And people are evolved, have just reshaped already existing grasslands. And our results support recent previous work. For example, Archibald de Al in 2019 developed a unified framework for plant life history strategies that are shaped by fire and uh, herbivory. There is also Hampson et al, also in 2019, who determined alternate grassy ecosystems depending on uh, grass flammability and uh, palatability. Our next question was, what would then be the impact of an increasing tree cover on the grass itself? And to answer that, I ran an experiment for a year during which I grew grass species under different levels of shade as proxy of tree cover. They were grown at full sunlight, 20% shade, 40% shade and 60% shade. Every three weeks, I measured different traits to monitor their growth. Here we can see the changes of one species, which is Schizacherium sanguineum, in each shade level treatment from the beginning of the experiment to around 30 weeks of uh, growth. At 24 weeks, for example, we can see that Plants in no shade and 20% shade are growing well compared to the individual in the shadiest treatment. And in the end, grasses were harvested. We separated the above and the below ground biomass and uh, we dried them and uh, weighed them. One of the very significant effects of shade on the grasses that we found was 
the decrease of uh, root biomass of plants grown under the lowest light availability. Here are pictures showing the differences between root biomass of Andropogon trichosigus grown in 0% shade and 60% uh, shade. We can see the huge difference. Plant grown without shade developed this massive underground biomass, whereas the one at the shadiest treatment struggled a lot to build this tiny amount of uh, biomass. So from that experiment, we found that grasses adjust their growth in response to shade. Low light plants allocated significantly less biomass to root and more to leaf tissue than high light plants. Their leaves become also bigger in area, but uh, thinner, which means higher specific leaf area. And these are all changes intended to increase light harvesting capacity under uh, low light. And that brings me to the take home messages of my talk. First, against the common narrative that Madagascar was only covered by forest prior to human settlement, we have evidence that vast grasslands of the Central Highlands are not degraded forests. Rather, they were shaped both by animals and the fire over millions of years, and they urgently require further research. It builds narrative of grasslands as a widespread ancient part of Madagascar's landscapes. Second, extensive tree planting programs represent a major threat to these grasslands. We show that shade alters grass growth and architecture, and the radical reductions in below ground biomass with reduced light availability suggests that grasses would be rapidly lost from shaded environments with a diminished competitive capacity or ability to re-sprout. In addition, not only planting of mostly exotic tree species damaging for these ancient and diverse systems, but at scale it has also been shown that it will reduce stream flow in a region where food security in Madagascar is already highly precarious and uh, agriculture in the central part is very dependent on abundant stream flow for uh, rice production, for example. And the last but not the least, effective land use policies are necessary to preserve these ecosystems for the sake of future conservation and the livelihoods. Now I would like to thank the people who made a significant impact on my study. All my three supervisors who are great instructors. I am also thankful for the help everyone in KMCC gave me during all of those years spent with them. And my sincere thanks to Stuart Cable for all the support. Thank you for your attention.